The stone piers that have stood for more than 150 years are the only reminder of the Byram Bridge that once crossed the Delaware River. The bridge was destroyed in the catastrophic flood of 1955. These piers have held up against the erosion and ice flows on the Delaware. The Tohican Creek flows into the Delaware River near here. A number of historic bridges cross the Tohican. Almost every other bridge type into the mid 20th century is represented here. And so we have a transition from fords to stone bridges, to covered bridges, to iron bridges, to concrete bridges. And it, it runs the entire gambit. And then we also combine automobile transportation, horse and buggy transportation, with canal transportation and river transportation. And so this is really in a very small area, about an 11 mile area, almost uh, an encyclopedia of Delaware Valley bridge types all in one area that you can drive and see. Professor Rob Reynolds has studied the bridge crossings and preparing a National Register of Historic Places nomination for the 20 square mile area buffering the Tohican Creek from Lake Nakamixon to Point Pleasant. The cabin run covered bridge built in the 1870s is located along a route settlers often took through the region traveling to Philadelphia. The structure received its name from some of the cabins built near the bridge right of way. Uh, this is a, an example of a Howe Trust. Uh, there are three Howe Trust bridges here in the Tohican Historic District, two of which are covered bridges and one of which is an open span bridge. The Howe Trust was patented, so um, there were actually royalties paid for it, and that's really why the bridges are covered. The trusses run along the sides of the bridge and they're made out of wood, and in order to protect them, um, the roof was put over them so that they'd last a lot longer. And here we have an example of one that's lasted uh, almost 150 years. The Means Ford Bridge at Ralph Stover State Park is nationally significant. The bridge is a very unique bridge. Uh, it's 178 feet long, and it's what's known as a boxed Howe Pony Trust Bridge. And if you look at it carefully, you can see the boxes on each side. What, it, normally in a covered bridge, the um, uh, truss work is covered by a roof. And in this case, it's boxed and left open to the sky. So this is a bridge type that in most cases hasn't survived in America. Um, it's the longest of seven of these bridge types left in the country, left in the United States, and it's the only bridge of this type uh, left in Pennsylvania. The superstructure at the base of this bridge on Rolling Hills Road is a design from another era. Um, it looks a little bit nondescript, but when you look carefully at it, uh, it turns out this is a circa 1910 concrete arch bridge that was originally constructed as a one-lane bridge. It was engineered by A. Oscar Martin, who was the county bridge designer and who left quite an incredible legacy of bridges across Bucks County. And later on it was widened to two lanes and they maintained the integrity of the, of the bridge and kept the original bridge to do it. Both Cabin Run and the Means Ford bridges are protected from replacement. A number of other bridges in the proposed Tohican Creek Historic District aren't receiving the same protections. Fly's Bridge is a rare wrought iron bowstring truss bridge. The crossing needs maintenance and paint. We don't know how many there are, but they certainly, there certainly are not a lot of them left. It's the only one I've seen in this region. This bridge type is what began to compete with covered bridges. Covered bridges had, you know, were truss bridges. They were roofed over to protect the wooden trusses. But the use of wrought iron and the beginning of the iron industry after the Civil War led to innovations in metal bridges. And so this is the next type that you begin to see. A marble date stone from the 1800s can be found on one of the abutments. It's part of the pride that the commissioners had in making improvements throughout the rural part of Bucks County after the Civil War. Further west, the Creamery Road Bridge crosses the Tohican. It's a picturesque setting. The stone abutments and piers date back to 1835. Well, this is a very rare surviving example of a very large uh, wooden beam bridge, although the wooden beam is gone because in the 1930s, uh, the uh, deck was updated for automobiles. But the superstructure, the seven piers that hold up the current deck, are one of, you know, one of the largest examples in Pennsylvania of this bridge type. It, this is a bridge that's 200 feet long. Uh, it was built in 1835. And um, it's, it's a really great example of how earlier bridge superstructures were often reused. And we see them throughout this historic district with iron uh, bridges, covered bridges uh, being placed on top of them, and concrete bridges being placed on top of the superstructure. This happens to be a concrete example. PennDOT wants to replace this bridge. 
It's believed some of the stonework on the bridge is the same found in the nearby Harpo farmhouse. Um, the earliest part of the house I think predates the revolution. We have a, a rough date of 1780, but we think it might even be older. And it's really completely untouched. And when you look at the stonework of the house, it was built in successive stages. Three different stages for the main part of the house. And then in the 1970s, um, stone was utilized from the area to match that for another addition. And all of that stonework matches what you see in the bridge, which indicates quite likely they were quarrying the stone from the same location. And that's generally how a lot of these stone uh, edifices were created. Um, and, and one of the nice tie-ins is the materiality of the bridge with the materiality of the house as you rise up out of this low area where the crossing stands. As work continues on gaining a historic district designation, preservationists hope to investigate the possible connection between the bridge and the farmhouse. Well, one of the fascinating things about this part of southeastern Pennsylvania is stone architecture. And it's really these incredible creek watersheds where you have this kind of stone in a great mass uh, availability. And uh, even coming up from the river, you see stone walls that the Scots-Irish built to, def to uh, define their fields. And as you get further up into the German area, which is where we are here, you have a tremendous amount of German stone architecture. And there's also English architecture. Every ethnic group that came in here used what was most available. And quite likely, a lot of the earliest buildings were logged, but very few of those survive. And as people became more prosperous, they built in stone because they saw themselves building for hundreds of years into the future, the same way you would see in Europe. And so this stone architecture wasn't just a farmer deciding, I'm going to build a nice house for myself. He's investing in a homestead for his family for 10 or 20 generations ahead. That was the thinking of it. And it really unifies the area. Even though we have disparate and, and different ethnic groups coming through the area, the vocabulary of their buildings shares a common language through the use of materials that are unique to this region. By replacing this and other historic bridges, preservationists worry part of the fabric of this historic district will be lost. And this is monumental. I mean, you, if you look, at, if you go to Europe and you, and you see the impact of the Romans, you know, the, aqu the aqueducts they built are, are thousands of years old. This is the kind of infrastructure we have right here. These are the sorts of places that ought to be here in the hundreds and hundreds of years in the future. And it's possible. This is material that can be repaired, it can be repointed, it can be reused. All it takes is a sensitivity in engineering to meld a deck to a set of piers to keep a monument still going. You can't build anything like this today. If this is lost, you lose the whole idea of how this area developed and you superimpose an anywhere kind of situation that has nothing to do with the local region, its, its folk life, its vernacular, and its um, building traditions.